Hello world. My next guest is an experienced marketing executive with a deep knowledge of the software industry and online media arena with extensive experience in growing product lines and businesses from early stage to global success. Today, we're going to be looking at some of the issues surrounding B2B storytelling, how we tackle the thorny issue of brands no longer being in control of the story they tell, and if this has contributed to marketing losing perhaps the ability to tell a great story. Here to get radically transparent with me today is Peter Bell, Senior Director of UKI Enterprise Marketing and EMEA Commercial Marketing of Adobe. Peter, welcome to the show. Are you ready to get radically transparent with me? I am, thank you. And thank you for the uh, extensive and very warm introduction. Thank you. Absolutely. So for anybody who is currently following Peter, you know that some of the LinkedIn posts that he's been creating are quite thought provoking in the space. And this conversation actually was sparked when I came across Peter, one of your posts kind of diving into this topic. Um, So I'm just going to throw it right at you. Has marketing lost the ability to tell a great story? Hey, look, it's a loaded question and uh, I'm biased. I do think we've lost the ability to tell a great story. Um, I, I think it's, the situation is better in B2C marketing, I think. Though, you know, I don't think we see the sort of impactful, thought-provoking campaigns we used to see. And I think in B2B marketing, it's always been a challenge. Um, and just that desire to measure everything, you know, measure if you can measure it, it's great. If you can't measure it, it must be a waste of time. And we have to be careful with that. And I, I think that that desire to measure everything means uh, we're missing the most important thing of all, which is just that art of telling a great story. Absolutely. And and so listen, I know what it was like, I don't want to age anyone out, but like 50 years ago, 40 years ago, right? We really saw that brands were leading these taglines, these phrases that actually almost, right, you could argue became the brand. Could you share maybe some of your favorite examples of what you see as great storytelling from anywhere across, right, the, the market? Yeah. Industry? Um, and and so, why do you think we no longer see them? Uh, the, the, ones, the ones which have stayed with me, uh, one, they were durable. Uh, they tended to run for a very long time. And they didn't just define marketing, they defined the company. Uh, so let's take uh, Audi's uh, Bosch Brunduk Technik, you know, and behind that was a story, which was their cars were German and they were reliable. And, and at the time, you know, car, cars weren't like the word today. I mean, cars today are fantastic. It doesn't matter what you spend, but they're not going to break down. They're not going to rust. By and large, you know, they're, they're also safe. Uh, none of those things were true when uh, Volkswagen Dove Technik uh, was put in the market. And just that use of German language, it immediately, you know, that's unusual. What does that mean? And it just, it, it, the narrative I, I recall is that undercurrent of German reliability. Mm -hmm. And just the use of German words in English advertising, I think just it cut through uh, and it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, My other, uh, which these days is uh, also not in use and is tarnished, is the world's favourite, I'll try that again, the world's favourite airline, uh, which of course was for British Airways for years. And that was just this idea of glamour. This is where, you know, if you wanted to travel in style and in comfort uh, to exotic locations, then you'd go, well, who else? would you travel with you travel with the world's and they use the word favorite airline but the implication was best most glamorous uh great customer service and of course for many years that was true um sadly not so much these days uh and i do wish they'd uh they'd get back to the basics of great customer service but fundamentally those two stand out and just a couple of other ones uh, for smash for mash get smash uh, which was for pow- uh, powdered uh, potato, which let's not divert ourselves as to why anyone would eat powdered potato, but uh, it stayed with me. And a, a really good one uh, from Victor Kayam, uh, who, who liked the product so much he bought the company. I won't name the company. I'll, I'll leave that for people to look, look up. Uh, but the narrative was the product was so amazing. He felt compelled to go buy the company. The product itself wasn't good enough. Um, and what a powerful story. 
I, I agree. And listen, going back to what you shared kind of when you open, when, when we, we, I think we can agree, right. To some extent, marketers have lost that ability to tell a great story when we understand and, and try to put together a great narrative. I think, right. What you said, if it's not measurable, it doesn't matter. If it's not, if you can't prove that it's having an impact on revenue, yeah. does it have a space in the organization? So if we can agree today, right that marketers perhaps are no longer in control of the message. Do you believe that there's hope and that marketers can still create a narrative or perhaps can you walk us through in your opinion, what do you think in today's digital landscape, especially, right, marketers can control? So I'd say the absence, uh, I think the challenge with storytelling is if you haven't actually understood your narrative, it becomes very, it becomes very difficult. And the examples I've been using are companies who really had worked hard, that the, it was a company narrative. Yes, the market has brought it to life with some really great advertising, but more than anything, it was a company narrative. And, you know, what was promised on, you know, through advertising was then replicated through the experience. And yeah, there's, too, com- too many companies are either trying to make a promise they can't keep, so the experience doesn't match the narrative. And this is true of quite a number of direct-to-consumer, you know, startups where, a, you know, a very slick website promise of you know, many promises made, and then the reality is the company's immature and it just doesn't deliver on, on the promise. And so whether you're a you know, brand new company or a large established company, you, you've got to be able to deliver upon it. Um, I think just... The, the narrative is so important because my examples from uh, earlier years are from a situation where broadcast media was the, really the only medium in which you would uh, you'd hear about a, a product or a service. Um, you might have a neighbor next door who, who'd bought a car from Audi in my earlier example, um, and maybe they'll tell you they had a good experience, but you couldn't log on to the internet, you couldn't poll millions of people. Uh, there wasn't social media and so you kind of had to you know you rely on the broadcast media and that's what you heard now clearly you know if you're making promises it doesn't matter how much you're in control of the of the the messaging you know if the product doesn't keep up then ultimately it will all catch up with you but the challenge today is uh, you're not in control of the message you know it's people are telling stories about you through social media your customers are recounting their experience um, people can go do their own research. Um, you've got your employees who will also be vocal. They're no longer invisible and they'll have things to say. So if you assume that you're not in control of the message, then it's even more important that you have a core narrative uh, so that the story you're telling through your marketing and through your advertising is the same story your employees are advocating in their pub, in uh, their presence on social media, et cetera. In fact, why not empower them? Give them a, you know, give them an employee advocacy platform and you know, equip them to go tell your story for you. It's far more powerful. Same for your business partners and same for your customers. They are going to talk about you. So you need to build a strong narrative. And you know, a good current one, I think, uh, two current ones. I think Tesla, you know, have you ever met a Tesla company, a customer who doesn't want to tell you how great a Tesla right. is? It's yeah, like, really. <laughs> if there is one, I don't know where they are because, and the power of that, you know, the story that Tesla has told is being retold through their customers. And, and Peloton uh, created a similar one uh, really? where, you know, <laughs> a Peloton uh, owner is, is going to take at least 20 minutes of your life telling how amazing it is and you should get one. And I think they're, they're good examples of brands who understand, look, I'm not in control, but I can write a strong narrative. I understand who I am as a company. And then the marketers, the business partners, the employees, and the customers take that story forward. I love that. I love that example of Peloton only because, so I'm sitting you know, out of Israel and I remember, right, when I didn't even know what Peloton was, but I, I suddenly saw on social media, literally every single one of my friends, I'm yeah. originally from New Jersey, all of them had Pelotons. They're all posting yeah. about how amazing and inspirational it was. And I, and no, this is not an ad for Peloton, right? They are not sponsoring our podcast, but I was amazed by the, the, the buzz and the community that they were able yeah. to build so fast. And 
and I, yeah, that's a great example. Um, and I agree right, right. Employee advocacy is in, an interesting topic, which I feel we could get into on a whole nother podcast, but it's another avenue to be able, right. To tell the right story at the right time. And then I think the layer there is to the right person. Right. And I think that's yeah. where the magic truly happens. Completely. A hundred percent. So listen, I want to wrap up. Um, and I would be lying if I said I did not do my due diligence and look over at your LinkedIn profile before this interview. And, and you've got a wealth of experience, a very interesting background. I'm curious to know if you could share with us today something about yourself that we cannot learn from simply looking at your LinkedIn profile. And I'll add a layer of complexity in, in tune of today's theme. Can you tell us a story or narrative about that thing that we don't yet know? Oh, so let me share this one. Uh, this, was, this is not icebreaker and, you know, you go to a meeting, you have, you've got to do, you've got to tell, you've got to do this. You've got to tell people something they don't know about yourself. So I, I don't always use it and this is probably ruined forever and for now telling it here, but um, I have kind of my nuclear option, which is no one is going to better this one. So we all know the phrase, uh, which is uh, shooting yourself in the foot. You know, uh, it's a common phrase people would use in conversation and business. Oh, I've shot myself in the foot. Uh, I'm probably the only person you'll ever talk to who has not only metaphorically shot himself in the foot, but <laughs> actually shot himself in the foot. What? Peter? <laughs> so as I, I lived in the countryside and so as a nine-year-old boy, oh, uh, no. I, was walking up a, I was walking up a hill and uh, the gun went off. It, thankfully, it was just an air rifle. So anyway, I shot my foot. I still have two feet. It's okay. <laughs> and uh, can you imagine, as a parent, I can't imagine this, but can you imagine getting a phone call at work from your child to say, I've shot myself. Can you come home? Because <laughs> um, I can't. <laughs> um, Anyways, uh, the, uh, the epitaph to this short story is end up going to hospital. They decided they had to put me under general anesthetic to cut it out. Goodness knows why. <laughs> and um, as a penance, uh, the, day I, the day after the operation, I was in hospital and I saw every single minute of TV coverage for the Charles and Diana wedding from seven in the morning till <laughs> 10 at night, nonstop. <laughs> because the TV was at the end of the bed and that taught me a lesson. <laughs> so every time I see a royal wedding, I'm reminded of uh, the fact that I did indeed shoot myself in the foot. <laughs> there you go. I think that's a meaningful lesson. Peter, it's been a pleasure getting radically transparent with you about messaging and uh, storytelling and narratives. Where is the best place uh, to reach you, should anybody want to continue the conversation around storytelling, narratives, um, marketing, or shooting yourself in the foot? <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the I am good on LinkedIn. Uh, I am less good on Twitter. Uh, I I use Twitter mainly to follow my passion, which is is football. Uh, I was born in Newcastle, so uh, it's it's a lifelong curse. It's a religion, but uh, so yeah, but um, definitely LinkedIn. It is by far and away uh, where I keep my kind of personal presence and I'm pretty good on it and not, you know, no service level guarantees, but I am pretty good on it. Amazing. Peter Bell, thank you so much for getting radically transparent with me today. Looking forward to do it again soon. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Radically Transparent podcast brought to you by Octopost, the only social media management and employee advocacy platform architected for B2B. I'm Jennifer Gutman, your host and director of social strategy here at Octopus. And if you love today's show, we'd love if you subscribe, rate, and give a raving review wherever you get your podcasts. For more discussion on B2B social media marketing, be sure to follow Octopus on LinkedIn. And of course, to gain access to all our free social media marketing and employee advocacy resources, head on over to our website, www.octopost.com. Until next time.